Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Jennifer Mitchell, and I am responsible for the district's educational resources. Today, we have a great webinar from Rob Matson, who has been working in Florida Springs for 25 years. As part of his responsibilities at the St. John's River Water Management District, he conducts annual surveys on submerged aquatic vegetation in seven springs, spring runs in the St. John's River. And Juniper Creek is his favorite. This is the fifth of our weekly webinar series that we're hosting to provide opportunities to educate our residents on the work that we do at the St. John's River Water Management District and how individuals can help to protect our water resources. The series is going to continue weekly through June when we will focus on a different core mission each week. Our next webinar will have our executive director, Dr. Ann Shortell, speaking with us about water supply, and that will be on June 4th. Please sign up for that on our main website, and we hope you'll join us for that. Just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website. I would like to remind everyone that they will be on mute throughout the presentation. Feel free to type in questions in that question box as they come to you, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question during the, the meeting time, we will make sure we reach out to you and get you that answer. Thank you so much for your attendance today, and I'm gonna hand it on over to Rob. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. So glad to be with everybody today. Talk a little bit about a, a subject that um, is uh, definitely near and dear to my heart. The springs of Florida have been known and used by people for centuries as sources of fresh water, clean fresh water uh, for uh, fish and shellfish, and they attracted game. When um, the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto came through uh, Florida uh, in the uh, 1500s, he encountered a large village of Timucua people near Silver Springs. Uh, it was an area that the Timucua called Ocali. And of course, going even back to the original discovery of Florida by Europeans, when uh, Ponce de Leon arrived, the, the legend was that he was searching for a spring whose waters were reputed to rejuvenate old men, aka the fountain of youth. That in fact is, is not true. Like the other explorers, he was searching for land and, and riches. Uh, but yet nonetheless, the, the legend kind of persists. And uh, even, um, you know, before people came to Florida for other attractions or for the beaches, they came to Florida for the springs. They were, they were, the springs were kind of the draw. The picture on the left there, uh, after, in the late 1800s, uh, a businessman here in Palatka, Hubbard Hart, uh, had constructed a, a fleet of small steamboats. He would load people up in Palatka and bring them up to Silver Springs. Uh, where they could stay overnight in a hotel he and some other folks had uh, had built. Um, and then, of course, Silver Springs eventually became almost the flagship attraction in Florida. Uh, the glory days on the right there in the 50s, you had Silver Springs with its glass bottom boats. You had Wikiwachi Spring, the Spring of Live Mermaids, Homosassa Spring, Nature's Giant Fish Bowl. So again, uh, folks folks came to Florida for the springs. These were were known uh, throughout the throughout the nation. So talk a little bit about freshwater in Florida. Uh, some of the other speakers in the previous uh, webinars have, have talked about this. Our, our major source of freshwater in Florida uh, is beneath our feet. It's a, a large groundwater system called the Florida Aquifer. This is also the main water source for our springs. And almost because of the springs, they're kind of the nexus. Surface water and groundwater in Florida are a single resource. They are, they are closely connected. And another little factoid to mention is that really for much of the Florida aquifer uh, uh, in peninsular Florida, um, the main source of quote unquote new fresh water is rainfall. There are no underground rivers coming out of Georgia or out of the Appalachian Mountains. 
So the textbook definition of a spring is a point of focused groundwater discharge from groundwater flow systems. And those last few words are important because the water coming out of the spring comes from somewhere. It comes from this land area that we call the spring shed, the area of land which contributes uh, groundwater recharge, rainwater recharge, to the groundwater, to the aquifer, and thence to the to the spring system. In older books, it's called the recharge area or contributing area. Here's an example. Here's Silver Springs. Uh, so my little circle there bouncing in, that's uh, Silver Springs, the headwaters of the Silver River. And the water coming out of Silver Springs comes from that land area delineated with the heavy black dashed line. Uh, it's mostly in uh, Marion County and it goes northward uh, into a little bit into uh, Alachua and Putnam County and to the south a little bit into Lake and Sumter County. But that's where the water coming out of Silver Springs comes from, the rain that falls on that land area and recharges down to the Florida Aquifer and then makes its way to uh, Silver Springs. Again, it's, there's no water from Georgia coming out of, uh, out of Silver Springs. Um, so if you, draw, if you look at uh, a map of, of a part of the northern half of, of Florida and you draw a line from uh, Tampa Bay across to um, uh, Cape Canaveral like I just did, pretty much all of the springs of Florida are located north of that line in the northern half of the Florida Peninsula and the eastern part of the Florida Panhandle. And we'll come back to that in a bit because that ties into uh, the geology where you find springs in Florida. Uh, some pictures, photos of some of the uh, better known springs of the St. John's River. Um, Volusia Blue, Wakaiwa, Rock Springs. We'll talk about some of those names in a little bit. And on the lower line there, some of the springs found in the Ocala National Forest. Um, so why are springs where they are? It really ties back to geology and, and geomorphology. We find springs where that Florida aquifer, that groundwater resource, is close to land surface or uh, in a condition of what geologists call unconfined. A good example here would be the St. John's River. So what I'm showing there is the St. John's River Water Management District with the St. John's River running down the middle and each of those little black triangles is a mapped spring and you can see they're located roughly in that middle river region between uh, Lake Harney on the south and uh, and Dunn's Creek on the on the north, and that's because that is where the Florida aquifer is is within 100 or so feet of land surface. Those are the hotter colors, the the orange and the yellow. As you go north towards Jacksonville or south towards the headwaters of the St. Johns River, those are the cooler colors. The aquifer dips deeper. Um, be beneath much of South Florida, it's the Floridan is very deep, and so it, it can't outcrop as, uh, as springs, as, as groundwater discharge. Similarly, as you go west to the Suwannee Valley area, all of those springs are where the, aqua, the Florida aquifer is close to land surface and or is, uh, is unconfined. Um, spring names to me is a, is a little fascinating. You know, where do the springs get their names? A number of our springs, the name comes from uh, what the Seminole Creek people called it. So one of the other native tribes that occupied Florida uh, as Europeans colonized. So uh, you've got Wikaiwa, which is from the Seminole Creek for spring of water or bubbling water. Wikiwachi is sort of a modification of that. Homosassa, Ishtukni, and one of my favorites, Chazahawitska, which means pumpkin or gourd opening place. The Chaz is a spring-fed river on the Gulf Coast of Florida, right about at the border of uh, Hernando and uh, Citrus Counties. And then some, obviously a lot of spring names are descriptive, Silver Spring, Blue Spring, Rainbow Spring. And then some spring names are from named after people or places. There are a few springs in Florida named for uh, Ponce de Leon, the uh, European who discovered uh, Florida. Alexander is probably named for an early family uh, who settled in, in, in the area. The basic layout of a spring ecosystem, uh, the spring itself, that's the spring pool, that's what, what Mokes most folks see and think of when they think of the spring. In the bottom of the pool will be one or more vents, openings in the, in the lime rock out of which the groundwater comes. 
um, over the vent, the area of turbulence over the vent caused by the outwelling groundwater is the boil. Some folks call the whole spring pool the boil, and that's okay. Uh, there'll be some type of a channel or a run that conveys the spring water uh, downstream. If it's long enough, it'll have a name like Wakiva River, Ishtuckney River, Rainbow River, something like that. And associated with many of our springs is, is some type of a submerged cave system. Those are kind of the basic parts of a, of a spring ecosystem. One of the main ways we describe or classify springs is by the uh, amount of water that they discharge on, a, on an average annual basis, the average annual or mean annual flow. Uh, the scheme here that's shown on this slide, this was a scheme worked out by hydrologists with the U.S. Geological Survey back in the early 1900s, a fellow named Meinzer and, and some of his colleagues. The largest springs are the first magnitude springs springs, which discharge on average, annual average, greater than 100 cubic feet per second. That's that CFS. If you do the math, that works out to 65 million gallons a day. That's the MGD. So the first mag springs, 100 CFS, uh, greater than 100 CFS. Second magnitude springs between 100 and down to 10 CFS. Third magnitude, 10 to 1. And the system even goes all the way down to the little tiny eighth magnitude springs. But the springs that people really see and notice are those first three, the first, second, and, and third mag springs. Some examples uh, on the left there, some of the uh, throughout Florida, some of the better known first magnitude springs, uh, two of the largest ones are Silver Springs and Rainbow Springs, uh, and then some of the others listed there. Um, Silver and Rainbow and Ishtuckney and some other systems are actually known as springs groups because there are multiple named springs or, or spring vents. And then on the right there, I've listed some uh, well-known second and third magnitude springs. Uh, in, in Florida. And then in the parentheses there, that is their long-term uh, mean annual flow. Um, another way to, to classify different springs is, is by their kind of basic water chemistry or water quality, the composition of the dissolved salts and ions that are in the spring water. And there are a few different schemes. This one that I show here, showing four kind of spring water quality types is from a, a University of Florida master's thesis uh, published some years ago. But some of the other schemes are very similar. So you got your a low ion or soft water type springs. And what I show in the next line there are the ranges of, of concentrations of calcium, that's the Ca plus or chloride, chloride ions, Cl minus uh, in parts per million or milligrams per liter. Um, so low ion or soft water springs, most of the springs that you know are the calcium bicarbonate water quality type with that uh, range of calcium and chloride. And then you've got the more mineral enriched springs, the mixed springs and the salt springs. You can see there uh, calcium and chloride and other dissolved ion content goes, goes up. Some examples, uh, some of the soft water springs, those uh, clear water seeps in Goldhead Branch, uh, State Park north of Keystone Heights and, and some of the steephead streams of the Florida Panhandle. Those are actually a type of a spring. Those are soft water systems. Again, most of the better known bigger springs of Florida are the calcium bicarbonate types like Silver and Rainbow and Ishtuckney. And then you've got your mixed and your salt springs and I've, I've listed some of those uh, there. Interestingly enough, really the only two places that you get these um, more mineral rich uh, or salty springs are in the uh, middle St. John's area and along the northern Gulf Coast between um, Hernando and, and Taylor counties. Um, and the interesting thing there is folks have known about these more mineral rich springs for 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 decades or, or even centuries in the in the 1800s and early 1900s uh, some of these in Florida were turned into uh, health spas and resorts like White Springs up in Hamilton County, uh, just a little bit to the southwest of that, Swanee Springs in Northern Swanee County. Um, 
a lot of these springs had the sulfurous odor uh, and folks would think uh, you know it's almost the old fountain of youth uh, um, idea that they would come to take the waters to to bathe in the water to drink the water it was was reputed to cure uh, various um, various digestive or, or skin ailments that kind of thing again you know the, the whole idea before folks came to Florida for the beaches uh, they came to Florida for the weather and for the springs um, and then we get into springs biology, the, the plants and animals that we find in our springs. You've basically got your uh, primary producers, your aquatic plants like algae and mosses and the flowering vascular plants or macrophytes. And then you've got the consumers, the invertebrates, fish and, uh, and, and other uh, vertebrate animals, which we'll look at. So the, uh, the, the exceptionally clear water of, of the springs and the, and the spring runs, the spring-fed rivers, allows for the proliferation of extensive and dense beds of, of submerged aquatic plants. On the right there are two of the pretty much the most common ones, the eelgrass, the valsneria, and spring tape, Sagittaria curziana. And then some other examples there on the, on the left, there's about uh, 25 or 26 uh, different uh, species of, of totally submerged aquatic plants that are found in um, Florida springs and, and spring runs. And then you've got plants that while they're rooted in the bottom of the spring, they, they grow out of the water, they emerge. Uh, things like different grasses and sedges and broadleaf type aquatic plants that you can see on the uh, left there. Some of them flower quite spectacularly. On the top right is a really nice stand of spider lily. Uh, that uh, my friend Jody Slater, my colleague at the district, took a picture of a, a few years ago. <clears throat> and then um, many of the larger uh, spring run streams like Silver River and Wakiva River on the lower right there, they have extensive floodplain swamps bordering the um, stream channel with wetland trees like cypress and various ash and, and that kind of thing. So some of the plant communities of the spring runs and then the group of critters that uh, that I really like, the creepy crawlies, the benthic invertebrates, the invertebrate animals found living in the uh, in the in the marshes and the grass beds and and in the bottom of the um, of the spring run. Things like aquatic insects, like the top row there, mayflies, caddisflies, uh, dragonflies. Most of these are the young form of the aquatic insects. And then on the bottom row, you've got various crustaceans like uh, amphipods or scuds grass shrimp, crayfish, that kind of thing. And then on the lower right, the mollusks, the snails and clams, like those uh, freshwater mussels that I've got there in my hand, uh, the bivalves. Um, and some of these, uh, we get into this concept called endemics. Uh, a number of these invertebrates um, are found only in, in one or a few uh, spring systems here in Florida. And that's what that word endemic means, found only in a very restricted area. There's a large family of snails, the hydrobeids or silt snails. A number of springs in Florida have one or two species of these hydrobeid snails, and that's the only place in the world you find them. Another snail, the goblin alemia, uh, is only found in a, in a select few uh, Florida springs. And then in the submerged cave systems, um, uh, beneath, uh, underneath the uh, spring, you know, through the, you enter it through the spring vent, uh, there are a variety of, of crustaceans which are adapted to that perpetually dark uh, environment. A number of species of crayfish on the uh, lower right there, they're, they don't have pigment, they're albino. Many of them don't even have eyes, uh, they just, find their way around by feel. There's a species of shrimp, and then there's some amphipods and, and isopods, uh, uh, sow bugs, which um, are found in these uh, cave systems. So um, very interesting. And then the fish, uh, obviously one of the, the more noticeable um, denizens of, of, uh, of Florida Springs, uh, largemouth bass and gar, and uh, on the lower right, the various uh, sunfish or brim species like bluegill. Uh, those are, you know, the spring attractions, the glass bottom boats uh, at, uh, at Silver Springs, and the, uh, the fish bowl that you can go in at Homosassa. That's the idea is to, to see the springs. And then on the lower left, we've got some of the more secretive uh, denizens, uh, American eel, which they come out at night, they're predators, and they, they uh, look for prey. During the day, they go down uh, the spring vent back into the cave system and, and hang out there during the day. 
And when we talk about fish, that gets into an, an interesting phenomenon associated with Florida Springs called marine invasions, where you get saltwater species able to uh, come up river and hang out in the springs. And it's largely these uh, more mineralized, uh, mixed and salty springs that's able to support these things. So the St. Johns River has been known, the springs of the St. Johns for many years for these marine invasions. And over on the Gulf Coast, you get uh, Homosa spring which is is one of those more mineral rich springs and you get a lot of marine fish invading up to the head spring from from the Gulf the list there shows some of the more common marine species that you'll see on the upper right those are striped bass in Silver Glen spring off the uh, St. John's River kind of think of those guys as the salmon of the St. John's the, as adults they live in the ocean but they run up the river to spawn and on the lower right there that's a picture I took in uh, Blue Spring near Orange City a few years ago. That's a small pod of, of tarpon um, actually hanging out in the spring. And then some of the other vertebrate animals that we'll see, uh, folks love looking at turtles. You'll see them sunbathing on logs, various sliders and cooters, uh, soft shell turtle, snapping turtle. We got a couple species here in Florida. On the lower right there is my good friend, Dr. Jim Nifong, with one of the biggest Florida snappers I've ever seen. That guy came from the Silver River, and we put him back. We didn't kill him. We were just doing some seeing what he, what he eats by looking at his poop. Um, of course, alligators, same thing as the turtles. You'll see them sunbathing on logs and such along the spring. Various amphibians like frogs and sirens, which is a kind of salamander. Lots of different birds, your wading birds, your swimming birds like cormorants and anhinga. And then a few mammals like otter and, and Florida manatee. The, the manatee is kind of the signature animal of Florida Springs. The, the manatee we have here in Florida are Florida manatee. They're a subspecies of the West Indian manatee found throughout the Caribbean. And this is the northern end of their range, their natural range. They are a tropical marine mammal, and um, during um, during the winter, when uh, the rivers and when the coastal waters drop below 68 degrees, uh, manatees don't like that. They need a refuge that stays above that all the time, and that's the springs. So over here in the St. Johns, that Blue Spring outside of Orange City, that's the primary. Uh, winter warm water refuge for the St. John's River manatee population. Over on the Gulf Coast, uh, Crystal River is an important manatee refuge in the winter for the manatees that live along the uh, upper upper Gulf Coast there. So um, they're kind of the, 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 the flagship animal of, uh, of Florida Springs. Blue Spring is in Blue Spring State Park, uh, just outside of Orange City. And they, of course, keep monthly attendance figures. They get more higher monthly attendance during the winter time when the spring run is closed to people use, because folks come to look at the manatees packed in there than they do in the summertime. More folks come there to look at manatees than they do to swim in the spring in the summertime. So that's a real whirlwind introduction to the to the springs. This uh, interesting picture here is Fern Hammock Spring, which is near Juniper Spring uh, in the National Forest. You can hike out to it, but uh, it's closed to, to swimming. And so that's gonna close it out and I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate that. Uh, this always gives me an opportunity to learn new things about the springs. We have a few questions coming in, and just a reminder for those of you who are uh, in attendance and have questions, please type those into that question box. One of the first questions is, what does the district do to monitor springs? Okay, um, you know, collecting data on the springs is uh, is important. You know, that's how we uh, evaluate what's happening to them and, and uh, whether we're protecting them. Um, the district working with the US Geological Survey, we do uh, monitor the discharge, the flow of, of pretty much all of our larger springs. Uh, in many cases, we have a gauge there that um, uh, collects the flow every day, daily. We also have uh, field scientists, field science teams who go out and take water samples to monitor water quality in the springs. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, they take those samples back to our lab where the water samples are analyzed. And then we do do some uh, biological monitoring in, in springs. As Jennifer mentioned at the beginning, a number of our 
our, our larger springs and spring-fed rivers, I go out annually and monitor those submerged aquatic plant beds. Uh, for some of our springs, we also do some other work with, uh, with universities, um, evaluating the, the fish and the invertebrates in the spring. So that's kind of uh, what we're doing. And then there, there are other agencies, such as the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, and the uh, Florida Geological Survey that also do, uh, do spring monitoring. And some of our uh, local counties, like Orange County and Seminole County, uh, get out and monitor their springs. Fabulous. So this ties in several of the questions that are coming in uh, are along this vein of with all of the monitoring, does the data indicate that the health of the springs is uh, in general improving, declining, staying the same? And uh, I would imagine that it's uh, very varies depending on what spring you're talking about. But what are some of those uh, challenges and the health of the springs right now? So yes, some of our springs are, are, in, are in exceptionally good shape, uh, particularly the, the springs within the Ocala National Forest because pretty much for as long as people have been here, uh, they've, they, they've been protected. Uh, but uh, a number of, of springs uh, in our areas that are experiencing a lot of population growth, urbanization or, or agricultural development, we're seeing some changes. We're seeing uh, pretty dramatic increases in a, in a uh, chemical in the spring water called nitrate which can act as a, as a plant fertilizer and, and can have some other harmful effects. So a number of our springs are showing the uh, increasing nitrate levels. And so there's a lot of management activity going on to try to address that problem. Some of our springs are experiencing declining flows. And we think there's a combination of factors there. Uh, d uh, changes in, in rainfall recharge patterns. Uh, they're just not getting the, the recharge that they used to. And then kind of layered on top of that is, is increased groundwater withdrawals. So um, there are changes happening and, uh, and the district and, and some of the other agencies are, are working to try to stop those and, and where we can reverse those. Thank you. I have a couple of questions here about, and I'll pull them together about the sulfur springs one of the do the sulfur springs in our area also have low oxygen content and what is it that's causing that sulfur smell to them okay so um in particular along the saint john's river um one of the reasons we get these salty springs is beneath the the saint john's river channel is actually a layer of of ancient seawater because uh, the saint john's used to be a coastal lagoon and a common one of the dissolved minerals in seawater is sulfate and down there in the groundwater where you have uh, little to no oxygen certain naturally occurring bacteria um, chemically transform that sulfate to something called hydrogen sulfide, which is a gas. And once that groundwater issues from, from the spring, that hydrogen sulfide gas outgasses from the water and that gives you that uh, sulfury kind of rotten egg smell. So that is a, a natural phenomenon. And yes, a number of the sulfur springs uh, are very low oxygen because it's that very low oxygen groundwater that's, uh, that's discharging out coming from, from deeper down uh, in, in the aquifer. I have a question here about how does the human activity such as swimming, boating, et cetera, um, influence our springs? Okay, good, another good question. And, and yes, you know, sometimes we, we, we can love our springs to death. Uh, recreational activity, you know, your feet uh, trampling on the ground, it, it, can, it can kill the, those submerged uh, grass beds. Um, um, uh, boating traffic, you know, the boat propellers and the anchors can tear up the grass beds. So uh, some of our springs actually have kind of like uh, probably the best example would be Ishtuckney, uh, Ishtuckney Springs State Park. Uh, they actually cap how many people can can come in the come in the spring and go tubing down the spring run and that's largely been done uh, to to exercise their the park system's responsibility to protect the resource and to protect the grass beds in uh, in uh, the uh, in the Ishtuckney River. So yes, recreational activity can harm a spring. 
um, and uh, and sometimes the things like caps on on how many people can come in uh, are are done to try to help protect the spring. Well, fabulous! Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention and attendance today. Please do register for our future webinars. Again, next week's will be focused on water supply, and Dr. Ann Shortell will be our guest presenter for that. And Rob, thank you so much for your fabulous presentation today. Yes, thanks for listening.